Hey guys, this is Deshaun Clark. Um, I just wanted to shoot this uh, quick follow-up video to the LinkedIn post. Uh, SharePoint developers will soon be out of work. Now, given that it was a very good marketing title, uh, it actually caught a lot of attention, generated a lot of comments. Uh, and I think the, in the comments it was really good because we were able to get a lot of SharePoint uh, developers, architects, admins, uh, evangelists, uh, product managers, product owners uh, to kind of weigh in on their perspective, you know, as far as their role, their, their client base, their company, uh, full time or consultant of what they seen and uh, if they agreed or disagreed with um, the trends that, of where SharePoint is going and uh, I guess the, the warning or the challenges that SharePoint developers will have if they continue down the full trust code pattern or uh, path. Now, uh, I, I just wanted to say that the, the warning is real. The, the warning is, is true. I think there is a lot of data that SharePoint is trending. It was, you know, it definitely is moving into this new modern era. It's more JavaScript driven, less full trust code driven. Uh, even if you're on-prem, I think this pattern and practice will hold uh, true. This client-side development practice will hold true. Now, I, I think this is kind of near and dear to my heart only because I was that developer back in 2007 uh, where I started, I've been working in, I've been in IT for like 15, 16 years. I've been in SharePoint for the last 10 to 12 years. But prior to SharePoint, I was mostly in uh, .NET, you know, when .NET first came out, you know, .NET 1, and kind of working through that, you know, whereas before it was like, uh, VB and VBcom and, and all this other good stuff. Uh, but I, I got into the package, one of the uh, packages that Microsoft purchased from a third party, uh, and they named it, they renamed it Content Management Server. And basically, Content Management Server was kind of like the product or the Microsoft product used to build intranets uh, for companies. And I've been, you know, I, I worked in there as a junior developer, uh, kind of, you know, worked my way up uh, through, through, through the years and through experience. And then I actually started consulting uh, with Content Management Server and actually went through um, many different installations, uh, building intranets, uh, many organizations, many different types of organizations. Um, and then, you know, I heard about this SharePoint thing, right? You know, it was the, back then it was SharePoint 2003, and I believe it was like GrooveNet or something like that prior to that. But I kept hearing about this technology and I kind of ignored it, kind of ignored it because, you know, CMS was hot. It was projects left and right. You know, I just focused on that. You know, I was comfortable with it. And, I, I, you know, I, at one point in time, I think I did take a look at SharePoint, uh, but it was, you know, it was kind of weird to me. I mean, because you had like, you know, they were saying a site didn't really represent a subdirectory and a site structure. It was its own entity and they had these, these things called lists and libraries and stuff like that. And I think there was like a plugin. The first time I got wind of it, uh, it was uh, with a client, uh, a big, mo uh, well, actually one of the top three uh, uh, automotive clients, and they were evaluating to use Plumtree Portal or uh, SharePoint to integrate with Content Management Server. I mean, this is prior to 2007, uh, where you really, you know, WCM was a separate product. So, you know, they were evaluating one, and they actually created two teams. So one team worked on the Portal side, the other team worked on the CMS side. Now, obviously, I was on the CMS side. But I had the opportunity, you know, to kind of take a peek into the portal side, and it, it was just a mess. I mean, they had these things called web parts. I really didn't get it, you know, and all this other stuff. Like, everything was treated like a component. Uh, it was just irritating to me. But then after a while, I, I, I jumped on this one client, and I was there. It, you know, all my projects started with six months. This one ended up going to, like, three years. And it was in New York, and then we switched over to Chicago, and I think they were looking to implement uh, SharePoint. But at the end of the day, they decided against SharePoint. They actually went with uh, IBM product. Um, and then I was left, uh, you know, so I had to find a job. Well, my experience was all in content management server. But everything that was out there, especially from a consultant standpoint, they were looking for SharePoint. And I had the hardest time finding a job. And actually, I did not find a job. It was one of those situations where I had to jump out of the consulting game go back to being a full-time employee uh, and really just kind of learn this technology. And ever since then, I promised myself to always keep a finger on the pulse of technology, especially in the Microsoft. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm from the Microsoft stack. I'm, I don't too much veer into, you know, the Java and the Java beans and all this other good stuff or, 
you know, Ruby on Rails or any of those other products. I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, in and out Microsoft stack, right? So I always vow to, to keep a finger on the pulse on where Microsoft was going, what was trending, what were clients responding to. And I think we're at another milestone with, um, because, you know, if you look at 2007, 2010, and 2013, SharePoint, they're all they're building blocks on the previous, right? They're, they're building blocks on the previous. There's no radical changes. I mean, yeah, 2010, I think that's when, like, the term store was introduced. And then 2013, um, you know, they enhanced it. I think they added some other elements that's, that's kind of skipping me. I know I think the term store came in 2013, but 2010 added, like, the ribbon or something like that. But in the end, it was all still web parts, lists, libraries, user profile, and most of the, you know, most of those other app services, you know, got a little bit more robust, and then you can interact with them. The APIs became a little bit more defined. You can interact with them. But this right here, the cloud, when, you know, initially when the SharePoint, you know, because O365 has been around since 2010, but really it was on-prem in the cloud and actually had less features and less capabilities than the on-prem version. But now, uh, with 2013, you know, you know, they upgraded on on to 2013. They made some changes to 0365, but now the 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 focus has shifted to the cloud, to where now 0365 is feature rich. Actually, more features than SharePoint to, uh, 2016, which was just released a few months ago. Went RTM a few months ago, and 0365 has way more features now. Right, I mean the new modern document library UI, the new list of document library UI, the site pages uh, UI, um, modern UI is mobile friendly, it's responsive design, all out of the box. Right, they have restrictions in O365 to where you cannot uh, customize the master page like we're kind of used to. Right, when we wanted to do a custom look and feel, we would customize heavily the master page. You know, even put it through like a Twitter Bootstrap framework on top of that make it responsive and all this other good stuff. But all those capabilities are there, but they're much harder. The recommendation is to not customize the master page. As far as Sandbox Solutions, which was kind of like our segue from on-prem to the cloud, we can still kind of do you know coding, uh, server-side code, as long as it was Sandbox Solutions. So we were still kind of comfortable, but now that's being deprecated. Again, they're taking things away. So it's almost made from a SharePoint developer standpoint, I mean, you're, you're kind of struggling. It's like, okay, how do I customize this thing now? You know, if the business have a requirement, how do I customize this thing? And now, you know, you have the add-ins and, you know, you the uh, SharePoint hosted add-in, provider hosted add-in. But even that stuff, uh, Microsoft is kind of retooling and redefining the best practices. And that's where the SharePoint development framework comes into play. And I'll tell you, the reason why they had to do SharePoint development framework, I think it's twofold. One... When O365 really started to get hot, and they said, okay, we're ready, this thing can scale, we kind of figure out all the wrinkles, uh, and they started pushing it heavily. And then, you know, of course, they have to complement it with Azure. That's just their cloud solution to run any other custom remote code. You know, for them, it's a natural fit if you go to the cloud. Um, but I think, I, I think what they're doing is that, like, okay, to make this thing really cloud ready, and really to adopt a model that's already been uh, tried and proven, that Facebook and Google and Amazon is using as far as like plugins and third party plugins and how you uh, can custom develop apps and things along, along those lines to integrate with those cloud platforms. I think they kind of took a chapter out of that book and said, okay, th this has to be a JavaScript type solution. Get rid of that iframe so it can truly be responsive design. And if there are areas that need to be customized, then you know they would have to do that in a remote server. So when we start talking about client side development, I mean that's, I think that's a huge spectrum. It's a wide spectrum, right? And not to be confused with uh, CSOM, which is the .NET remote uh, client side object model libraries that are really .NET centric, and, and it makes remote calls into SharePoint. And you can run those on a plain Jane. Windows Server, you know, either an Azure App Service, an Azure VM, or actually one of your uh, your own servers just that has access to the internet. I mean, you you can kind of run that anywhere, and once you're authenticated, you're good to go, right? And it kind of hides a lot of the token manipulation and, and all this other good stuff. So that's one end. But then you have the out of the box REST API, 
which are very limited. So CSOM is going to be closer than service side object model SSOM. REST API is going to be further away than that. And I'm going to just throw these numbers out there. Let's say CSOM is 85% parity compared to the service side object model. REST API is going to be more like 65%. And now what my, Microsoft is, is pushing also is this graph API which really kind of follows, if you're familiar with the Facebook API uh, service and how that structure, uh, those REST APIs, uh, the Graph API kind of follows, is very similar where everything is in the context of me, i.e. the current user and, you know, getting their documents, getting their files, uh, users around them as far as like, you know, the report to, the diaper reports, the team members, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's the Graph API. Well, the Graph API to date, uh, it's probably about mm, 40, 50 percent compared to the service side object model, right? So, you know, so that you have many different spectrums, but it seems as if Microsoft is gravitating towards the graph API because in the end, when we set up solutions in O365, right, the game plan, the way these are, applications are, are architected is that uh, you, can, you can actually develop very complex solutions in O365. Right, so even though you have gaps in CSOM, most of those gaps are going to be like in more, most of the edge case features like record management, document management, things along those lines. But as far as like manipulating data from a list, uh, manipulating documents, uploading documents, you know, adding content types, lists, provisioning sites, and all this other good stuff, all those are in those APIs are in the CSOM uh, API. And actually, if you really want to see the power of that, I highly recommend do a Google search on. O365, CSOM, PNP, and these are going to be the pattern and practice for CSOM, and I would recommend that if you are going to start a solution, a custom REST API solution to import, to base it off of the CSOM PNP, uh, Microsoft and the community have been working on those libraries, and I think there's updates like every month. And, and that, you know, I think there, you know, if there are gaps in CSOM, they're closing those gaps. They're actually asking the community, you know, what are some of the that gaps you're finding compared to SSOM or service side object model that you're missing or you need in order to make complete solutions. So, again, I, I you know, from, just from my past experience uh, and the lessons that I learned, the hard lesson that I learned where I was just heads down, heads down, did not have a finger on the pulse on what was trending, what was changing, what clients were demanding, what Microsoft was positioning itself to really better service the clients, um, I, I kind of I lost out. And it took me almost 18 months to recover. Uh, but ever since then, you know, I always vow to, to myself and to my family that, you know, I, I would just be more aware, you know, and I, and I, was, you know, and I will... Uh, you know, make sure that, you know, I'm always, you know, have my head on the swivel and trying to be more aware of what's going on around me and not just in my own little world. So that, that was the reason behind it. Uh, you know, if this, this video I, I, is going to be posted on YouTube so you can subscribe uh, to, to this channel. Uh, future videos, what I plan to do is to take you on the journey with me as I learn uh, O365 uh, the different scenarios and again O365 is forever changing I believe there's new features deployed in O365 SharePoint you know not to mention all the other products and the components that make up O365 but just O365 SharePoint alone there are new features being deployed every month it seems as if you know within that so it's, it's a little bit about a different ball game so I'm gonna do a series of videos to kind of show you through you know, one, how to compare O365 to on-prem, how most companies are positioning themselves to leverage O365, and then, you know, how you can stay, you know, how, you, how can you keep your finger on the pulse of when new features are going to, going to get dropped and released, and, you know, how you can prep and communicate that out to your organization so you can minimize the surprises to your end user. But for now, uh, again, I just wanted to do a follow-up uh, just to, to have a reasoning behind that initial video and then, uh, you know, where I came from and, you know, and why I think the warning is true and, and really just kind of urge other developers to, to now start the retooling. All right, see you on the next video. Take care.